Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured, but the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. In Book 3 of On the Ends, Cicero has Cato as the representative of the Stoic school set out some of the basics of Stoic ethical theory. And one of the key ideas that he brings up very early on has to do with what we can call the primary impulses or, if you like, drives or orientations of human nature. And there's really two things going on here in this discussion. One is that the Epicurean representative in, in the work has already argued that every animal from birth on desires pleasure and avoids pain. And so we can understand all of the things that we're doing in a sort of developmental view as having that as their underlying basis. The Stoics, like many others, reject this and they say, no, there's something different going on. We have to have a uh, alternate account of what the primary driving forces of human nature are. And I would like to say from the very beginning that, you know, Cato is not saying that this is, is what drives all human behavior in the present for developed human beings. This is the startings of it for babies and children and then perhaps for many other people who don't mature but as we do mature new things get introduced that that may stem from this but transform the basis so it's important to understand where we're starting from from infancy on but that's not the entire story being told so what is the stoic view they're not using the term oikeiosis here, which was a technical term in Stoic vocabulary, um, but this is indeed what is being discussed. Oikeiosis means, uh, on a very basic level, sort of a becoming familiar or stemming from familiarity with oneself, with what is within one's oikos, what is familiar, what is part of who one is. And they're not, again, invoking that term, but the basic conception here is the same. The idea is that all animals, everything that is animate, everything that has perception, that has locomotion to, to whatever degree animals do, have a certain basic set of impulses which involve what we could call awareness of self. A little bit later, in the discussion, Cicero is going to use the term sensum sui, being conscious of oneself, being perceptive of oneself. And this doesn't necessarily have to mean, you know, the proverbial navel gazing, very high level, you know, uh, thinking about one's own thinking or anything like that. No, what he's saying and what the, what the Stoics maintain to be the case is that every animal has some basic grasp of its own reality, of its own being, however dim that may be. So what does this involve? He says, the animal feels an attachment to its own self. It uh, can be framed in, in, in this way, that, that it, it has a relation of valuing on a very basic, perhaps not even articulate level of its own self. What, is, what does this take shape as then? So we can think about this in four ways. The first two are that it feels 
a kind of affection. The, the word that's used there can be translated as love or feel affection or even desire, deligre. Um, and you really should probably roll all of those in there. It feels affection towards what we can translate as its being. Uh, some translations have its constitution, its, its framework, what it is that makes it what it is. It's status in Latin. So it's not just the sheer act of being, it's being the kind of thing that it is. So for a baby, being that wriggling thing that has like little control over its own limbs and is feeling all sorts of things that it doesn't know how to process, that is its, its status, right? But also its relation to other things. And so it feels affection towards its being. It desires to, to maintain that. And what preserves it? Or we could go a little bit further and say, what conduces to it? And of course, for a little baby, um, it doesn't know very much about this. It's learning it sort of by trial and error, by you know, wetting itself and then being you know, dried off and cleaned, by being crying for food and being given food and feeling a bit better. It doesn't have any sort of overt conception of, well, if I take this food in, it's going to nourish me, and then I'm going to get you know, bigger and stronger or anything like that. Or if I don't eat this food, I'm going to die or something along those lines. But it has some sort of inchoate basic conception that this is something good for me and I should take this in. This is going to help me. This is conducing to preserving my, my being. So those are the first two things. It also has an orientation towards, you might say, what is negative. So its orientation is that it feels, and again, I'm just translating rather loosely here, it feels hostile. The uh, Latin word here is, uh, here we go, um, here it's translated, it feels an antipathy to those sorts of things, but the, the, the Latin word is alienari. Um, it feels that those things are enemies to it. So antipathy works, hostile works, um, any of those sorts of ideas. What does it feel hostile towards? Well, towards its own destruction or damage. What is going to lessen it? What is going to reduce it to nothing? It instinctively feels hostile towards, say, you know, baby wets itself. If it remains there in its own filth, uh, it's going to eventually get sick and it's going to hurt it more and damage it and, you know, perhaps destroy it in the end. So it cries and says, get me out of here, right? And so that's, that's part of the way it works. It, when it feels hunger, uh, it doesn't know that it's not going to die if it doesn't eat that minute. But a lot of babies, perhaps, we don't really know what's going on in their head in any uh, uh, explicit way. Perhaps it has that sort of sense of, of things going on. So whatever uh, is its own destru destruction, it's, it's feeling itself breaking down. And whatever does that, whatever threatens that, whatever conduces to it, it feels hostile towards that. So Cicero is saying that this is on a very fundamental, basic level. And this is what the Stoics actually did, in fact, think about that. So if that's the case, that means that pleasure and pain are not actually primary the way the Epicureans thought that they were. So he goes on and he says, pleasure, uh, uh, according to most Stoics, is not to be reckoned among the primary objects of natural impulse. It's not pleasure that we're actually desiring that's moving us. It's whatever is going to conduce to preserving the being that we already have an affection towards in being, in, in health, in robustness, in power, in however you want to frame it. And pleasure is a mere side effect of that. It's not really what's driving us. So the baby nurses, not just because it's something pleasant or because the baby says, I'm going to get pleasure this way, but rather it nurses because this is going to keep it alive and allow it to grow. And then it happens to get pleasure from that. And it says, this is a nice addition to that. So that's a, a key idea. 
Now, he also goes on and he says, there's other things that as human beings we are distinctively attracted to. And this takes us beyond the level of animality as such and into something distinctively human. What is that? He says, we're attracted to truth and knowing. You might say we're attracted to reality. We are attracted to grasping reality as such And we're also repulsed from, as he's going to say, the mistaking or non-grasping of of reality. So how does this take form? Again, we can see this with little children. Once they've actually mastered enough to provide them with reliable locomotion and some object constancy, and to be able to, you know, uh, get out of the situations that they're immediately placed in, like being stuck in a cradle or something like that. What do children do? They wander around tasting everything, sticking their fingers everywhere, grabbing things, looking at them, curious about things. This is why we have to actually keep them from killing themselves uh, when we're babysitting them, because they, they, they do want to preserve their own being, but they don't know enough about the world to, to successfully do that. But why are they out there looking? Looking at everything, well, because they're they're curious, they want to know. So he goes on and he says, acts of cognition, and the word here is just a uh, transliteration of cogniciones, right? Uh, knowing things together, you could say. And he says we could also call these, and again, just cognates from from the English to the Latin, uh, comprehensiones, comprehensions, percepciones perceptions. Or he says, if you want to use the Greek term for it, katalepsis. This is an important term in Stoic uh, epistemology or Stoic logic, if you like. Katalepsis means grasping. Lambano, uh, the word that lepsis comes from, means to grip, to grab, to reach out and, and get something. And to katalep, uh, you know, the katalepsis of it, uh, katalepsis in the singular, is to grasp it thoroughly and understand what that thing is. So this is something that we do, in fact, desire. And that motivates us as well. Um, He also tells us something quite interesting, and you can see a parallel here between the realm of action and the realm of knowledge, right? Both in terms of affection, how it is that we feel about things. He tells us that mental assent to falsehood is repugnant. It's something that repulses us, that drives us away. When we realize that we've got things wrong, Uh, unless we're screwed up, we don't double down and say, oh man, I know this is wrong, but I'm going to keep believing this anyway. No, we actually feel a a sort of disturbance when that happens, according to the Stoics. And according to not just the Stoics, but many other observers of human psychology. So this is something that is among the primary impulses of human nature as well. And this leads us, he says, to, um, you know, children having pleasure and finding something out for themselves by the use of reason, even though they gain nothing by it. The sciences become things we choose for their own sake, partly because there's in them something worthy of choice, partly because they contain acts of cognition and contain an element of fact established by methodical reasoning. We like to use our mental faculties, just like we like to use our bodies to do things. So, These are things that are fundamentally driving us. And the last thing I want to say about this is that Cicero and the Stoics and Cato will frame this in terms of what is in accordance with nature. That's a phrase that you see the Stoics using quite often. You notice they're beginning from natural impulses and saying you can understand how human beings develop from those natural impulses and drives. But then... We go beyond that. This is not the end of the story. As we move towards wisdom and the moral good or virtue, uh, we are going to go beyond these mere impulses and the well-worked out sort of affections, cognitions, 
and actions and choices that they involve. And that's going to lead us to a higher phase of human development. 